All right, hello everybody. We're gonna get started with the, uh, today's uh, presentation. Uh, so welcome everybody to uh, Pop City Center's uh, Brown Bag Seminar, um, uh, which is actually joined with the Inclusive Research Matters uh, series um, organized by ISR. Um, uh, I am part of the uh, educational uh, working group, uh, DEI working group here at uh, ISR who partners with other groups to um, uh, organize this Inclusive Research Matters series. And uh, today I have a, a, a pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Katie Hausman, who's an associate professor at the Ford School of Public Policy. Um, I have uh, uh, brought her uh, bio here because it's really, really long. Uh, she's uh, an associate of a National Bureau of Economics uh, Research. Her research focuses on environmental and energy economics, which of course is uh, a top of on, in everyone's, pretty much everyone's mind. Uh, her recent work includes inequality and environmental quality impact of a climate change on the electricity grid and the effects of a nuclear power plant. And really fittingly for today's topic, uh, she has taught statistics and a policy seminar on energy and the envir environment and a course on government regulations of industry and, uh, and, and the environment. Um, I'm really, really looking forward to her talk today titled uh, Teaching Inclusive and Policy Relevant Statistical Methods. I do teach STATS method in this building for grad students, and I could think of a lot of uh, good examples to make the class to be inclusive, but policy relevant is something that I'm not really familiar with, so I'm really looking forward to your talk today. There you go, Katie. Um, and for the housekeeping, if you have any questions, those on the Zoom, feel free to use the chat to throw in any questions. We're going to wait till the end of the um, uh, Katie's talk, and we'll uh, discuss, we'll, we'll talk about questions and answers at that point. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, is the mic working? Good, extra important since we're on Zoom. Thank you for having me out, especially at a time in the semester when most people I know are just trying to like hold on to the cliff by their fingernails for the next two weeks. Um, but it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. I know that many of you teach some version of stats or regression analysis or data analysis. Um, and so I look forward to hearing your questions and how you approach some of these things in your own classroom or in your research. Um, caveats that I think are really important. There are many ways to teach quantitative methods, depending on student backgrounds and course aims and what program it's a part of. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how I've done it, and I'll give you the context for the class that I teach. Um, and it might look extremely different in other classes. What I want to show you is the approach that I've taken, because I think that has lessons no matter what you teach. Um, but along the way, I'll give examples and some content stuff to give you just concrete ideas of what I've done. Um, the other caveat is that you'll see this is the outcome of multiple iterations of the course, and I continue to learn new things, and I continue to update the class um, so all of this might be irrelevant in a year because maybe I'll be doing things totally differently, but I'll show you where I currently stand um, and also ideas for where I might go in the future. So the course context, what I teach is the first semester statistics class for our master's students. They are masters of public policy students, so it's a professional two-year degree. Um, this is a fall semester class, and then they take a second semester regression analysis class with a different instructor. So I'm supposed to be getting them to the point where they know what like OLS is with one right-hand side variable, and then they're going to learn many ins and outs of that in the following semester. Uh, within the Ford School, we have two versions, standard and augmented, and students can self-select into which version they go to. And I teach, I have been teaching standard but in close communication with my colleague who teaches augmented. So I have twice done a big revamp of the class over the years. The first time was around five years ago, and I hired three students to help me over the summer. And I'll tell you why I hired three, and I'll tell you why I hired them, and I'll tell you why I have students. Last year, I revamped again, and I did the same thing. I hired three students over the summer. At the same time last year, I also changed the textbook, overhauled the written assignments, changed the way we teach data. So I'm going to give you a flavor from each revamp of kinds of things that I have changed over time. So we'll mix the two revamps together today. So the first revamp that I did around five years ago was designed to tackle questions that I think many instructors across different universities and departments and at different undergrad versus master's versus graduate levels, uh, we face similar questions, which are Sometimes the criticism is 
Quant courses don't handle issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion well. The qualitative or the theory instructors do a great job of that, but the data-oriented instructors don't do a good job. Something you sometimes hear. A more sort of extreme version of that that I have heard at multiple units uh, is quant methods are in of themselves exclusionary. It's kind of weird to say that standing in this room in this building, um, but I'll give you a flavor of why I think this is sometimes the criticism we hear and what we do about it. Um, and I, I recognize that that bullet point is particularly sort of contentious, um, and we might not all agree in this room on how to handle that bullet point, but I'll tell you where I think about it. So for that first revamp, those were the two things I had in the back of my mind. And so I hired three students. I hired them because this has a flavor of DEI work. And a lot of students are really wary of taking on extra DEI work. I, didn't, I wanted to make sure that I hired people and paid them the value of their time because uh, we know that those burdens are not taken on equally across students. So I paid them similar to what I would pay a summer RA and uh, shout out to CRLT for helping me fund it. I hired three because I didn't want anybody to feel like they had to speak for a whole group and because I knew they would bring different perspectives based on their own past experience um, and they could help each other. Some of the things we were talking about were really contentious. Um, for a first semester stats class, we got into lots of things about trans rights and racism and other hot topics that you will see. And I didn't want them to feel like a single student was like telling me what to do, but maybe as a committee of three, they would be more likely to tell me what they actually thought. Okay, the second revamp I did more recently was designed to address a different set of challenges. Um, and these are the statements you might sometimes hear for a methods class. Uh, students don't retain material from intro level classes. There's actually really great research to back this up. It's very depressing if you teach intro level classes to read this research. When you ask people five years down the line about what they learned in Econ 1 or Physics 1 or Biology or Stats, like they don't remember any of it. Which makes you wonder what we're doing. Um, but <laughs> We're doing something useful, come back to that. Um, sometimes you hear students aren't reading the textbook, which is frustrating because they show up and they don't know where I'm going when I start my lecture. Uh, sometimes you hear this class isn't applied enough. Um, that comes up in policy units like mine, but it also comes up in social science units. Um, and in a challenge that I have faced is that in one semester, I'm trying to take students from very different backgrounds and teach them like equations and applications and interpretation, like what you would do with the New York Times article about something, um, and coding and stata all at the same time. And some students are prepared to take on all three of those. Some students are prepared to take on just one, but not the other two. So trying to fit all of that into one semester can be really hard. So when I revamped, it was designed to try to address all of these concerns that you might hear. And what I, so I started with these two books at the bottom, which nicely summarize the depressing research that people don't retain things, but then they usefully give you ideas for how to help people retain things. And the starting point was, number one, what motivates my students? So like getting into the mind of a first year master's in public policy class student, why are they coming to my class? What do they care about? If I'm not starting with what motivates them and what they are curious and excited about, then they're not going to learn from me. So I needed to think through the profile of my students, which might be very different from the profile of your students. Related to that is a question of what have they excelled at in the past? All of the students that come to the Ford School are really good at something, or we wouldn't have let them into the Ford School. Um, this is the Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. But what they're good at might be really different across students. Some did a ton of quant type coursework in their undergrad. Some did more humanities stuff. Some of them have been out of school for a long time, but had really awesome public policy jobs. So they have different experiences to pull on when they come into my classroom. And I want to design the class in a way that allows them to connect that material to those experiences, because then they're going to actually retain it. And so based on that, I start with number one, what do they care about and what do they already know and are good at? And then where do I want them to be at the end of the semester? 
And I realized that there are a lot of things you can teach in first semester stats and I can't do them all. So what do I want them, like if I call them up in five years, what would I want them to remember? And then it's just straight line. How do I get from this to this? And the rest is like irrelevant. And so I just cut a lot of material to be honest because I want them to be able to go from what they know to the things I want them to actually remember when I call them up in five years. So that was my general process. And I think that is applicable no matter what kinds of material you teach, but now I'll show you what it actually looks like for this class. Um, number one, I think it's really common in methods classes to within class give a brief example. So maybe it's like super early days in the semester and you're teaching mean, median, and mode. And so you give them some examples based on income distribution in the US. I learned that my students don't remember those examples very well if I just throw them at the students during class because they haven't had a chance to digest it. They read the textbook, which was about the equations, but then if I give them the application only in class, they don't remember it. So instead of making them just read an equations book and then bring up the applications in class, I'm saying I really want them to know the application and the context and the interpretation as they would use it in the policy world. So I'm gonna assign readings with that too. And it gives them a chance to do it before they show up. So along with all the textbook chapters, I also assigned a mix of like smart New York Times articles, um, congressional research survey chapters, um, academic articles that were, you know, uh, sort of not so technical that they couldn't follow along. And then I said, they're gonna actually show up knowing that example and we can go into it in more depth. So I'll show you some examples of what I assigned. And then two, you know, a lot of students in my class historically didn't read the textbook. A mix of feeling like it wasn't gonna help them in a busy semester and they had more important things to do and feeling like if, I don't, if I'm not good at math, then why would I spend my time reading a book with a bunch of equations, just sort of being scared of, of cracking open this textbook? Um, so one thing I did was assign daily reading reflections. I now do this in all of my classes, whether it's an elective or um, a core class, whether it's a context, you know, a topical class like climate change or whether it's a methods class like stats. Something and whether it's a small class of 12 students or a class of 70, I still assign reading reflections. So I tell them for every day, every class day, it's not daily Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but every class day, you need to hand in about 100 words um, that summarizes the main point of the reading. What, did, what were we trying to take away today? One thing that you connected to previous material or to your own policy experience or professional experience, and then one question or doubt you still have. And what this does is it uh, two things. One, it gives any student a leverage point to break into the course material um, because they can connect it to anything they care about. So it's inclusive and in that it opens up the classroom space, no matter who you are, what your background is, to be able to connect to the material. And two, I learn a lot from reading these. If I can, I'll randomly select maybe 10 to read before I go into the classroom. And it helps me anticipate the things that they're gonna ask about during class. Um, sometimes I don't have time and so be it, but then I go home and read them and maybe come back to points that I missed the next day if something repeatedly came up in the reflections. Um, and I'll show you some example of really smart reflections I got last year. Then the third thing I did was add in more content related to equity and justice. Okay, so that's the broad idea. Let me give you examples of each of those threes. Three. So one, assigning the policy relevant example ahead of time. And I would put it on the syllabus. You had to talk about it in your reading reflections. You really needed to dig deep into this article. And then it would be my working example for today. So these are screenshots of two slides I might use in class. On the left-hand side, you have a graph from an article about military interventions and crisis escalation. Um, and so I tried to draw a mix of things about like income stuff versus overseas military engagement versus environment, like different topics so that different students could find something that they was on an issue that they cared about. Um, 
And so this gave me a chance to use these numeric examples. So like if we were doing t-tests or chi-squared tests, whatever we were doing for that day, I could do it all with the numbers from that article. And then they already had a contextual basis for the numbers we were using and why we're doing a chi-squared test with them. I could also use it to talk about strengths and weaknesses in the article's write-up. Here are things the authors did that I liked. Here are things the authors did that I didn't like, which allows us to be more critical thinkers than we are with something like just a textbook. Uh, another example, I used Donarski et al.'s Closing the Gap paper, which presumably many of you know about since you and co-authors were here. <coughs> Show hands who know this. Oh, man, this is a great paper. Um, okay, so this is <laughs> the paper where they randomly um, reach out to low-income students around the state of Michigan uh, with information about tuition guarantees at the University of Michigan. Um, and the methods, they, they do really sophisticated stuff. It's a beautiful paper in the AER, but the underlying ideas about randomization and RCT, how you use that, a balance table, a lot of the underlying stuff, it's stuff you teach in an intro class. So it's approachable. Um, and it's Michigan, which they care about, it's income, which some of the students care about. Um, so it's very, it's, as I said, approachable. That Donarski article I actually used at like three different points in the semester because we could use it on randomization day, causality day. We could use it on t-test day, looking at the balance tables. Um, there were a lot of points where we could come back to it. Okay, number two, I said I assigned these reading reflections and I want to show you four of my favorites. I got everybody's permission to share these with you. Um, and in red, I've added my own emphasis, things that I thought were cool about these reflections. So this person first describes actually about the Donarski paper, how the researchers randomize treatment and control status and how that allows them to do whatever, blah, blah, blah. And first the student notes, I remember seeing a figure from this paper at the beginning of the semester. And I'm excited to discover that now I understand it. So they're making this connection backwards to stuff we've covered before, which suggests to me that they're going to retain the information longer. And they're expressing enthusiasm. Like how often does that happen in a core required stats class? And they're like excited that they understand something. It makes it a lot more fun for me to teach if students are telling me that they're excited about stuff. I'm like, cool, and then I'm more excited to show up too. Uh, another one. This one is about t-tests. This was getting more into the nitty gritty of t-tests. So I think this might have been our second day talking about t-tests. Um, so first sentence is broadly summarizing that that is what reading does. Second point, I think this reading helped me better understand the purpose behind testing. So here, this is sort of like a metacognition thing. They're like reflecting back on why I'm assigning to them the readings and why we're using the methods that we're using. Um, so they're thinking not only about how to implement the thing and like what the state of code is, but actually why we're doing it, which again, I think is gonna help with retention. And then at the end, when the student talks about questions, they use the language about, I'm also curious. And again, that makes it a lot more fun for me and for them, they're enthusiastic, they're curious, they want to know the answer. <coughs> okay, here's one from Chi Squared Day. And I've X out the organization, but the student is connecting it back to their professional experience. In working with my nonprofit or my governmental organization, I don't even remember which one it was, and working with this organization, statistical testing is very common which means that the student is finding points of connection from their own lives, which is gonna help with retention and with motivation. Mm -hmm. And when they graduate, it's gonna help them figure out how to continue to apply it in work with organizations like this. And then the last point, the student says, wait a minute, we've done chi-squared, which is a relationship between two categorical variables. Well, what do you do if you have two interval level variables? Oh, like awesome, that's what we're doing next. <laughs> um, so they've anticipated where the semester is going, which means they're gonna better understand the logical connection across the different kinds of testing that we do. 
Last one. This is from a student that always asks me really tough questions in the like great way that you like to see. Uh, so it's again about chi-squared, um, summarizing what we're doing in chi-squared. And then saying, we've been doing degrees of freedom calculations. Those of you who teach methods to students who are super math oriented might know that this is like not the favorite topic or calculation in the semester. And the student is saying, what's the intuition behind the degrees of freedom calculation that we're doing for this particular test? So that again is this like metacognition of trying to understand what we're doing and where the formulas come from. And it wasn't, the intuition was not given in this textbook. So they were asking a really important and insightful question that couldn't be answered with the textbook. Um, and happily, since I read this ahead of time, I checked like four different intro level textbooks to see who describes the intuition in what ways. Um, I think two or three books didn't try at all, um, but I was able to bring the intuition from the one book that did. So it helped me anticipate the question and be ready to, to answer it. Yeah, Hoyt. You, you presented these as good, a good example. <laughs> what would be a bad example? Yeah. What would be a not good thing that you would read? And, and particularly, what would you? I have experienced this because my like daughter does this in history class. And when, I, when she puts them on the table and looks at them, sometimes I kind of cringe because I think, well, what did you mean by that? <laughs> Could you be more specific here and all these things? Yes. I, I gather that's what the did point. you mean? Um, okay, so it gets back to the, okay, so for those of you on Zoom, the question is what, these were four good examples, what would be a not good reading reflection that I would cringe at? So I do cringe at some and of the I'll reading reflections. Students. Students. Yes, apologies to current and past students. Of course, it wasn't you, it was somebody <laughs> else in the classroom. Um, so for, if the point is to get them to critically reflect on the reading, then a not good reading reflection would be one that skims the surface and doesn't try to make connections. Or one that zeroes in on a nitty gritty point and doesn't pay attention to what we're trying to accomplish. And I do see both of those. Um, but if the dual purpose of the reflection is for me to understand where they're coming from and adapt to my own teaching, then that tells me something. Even a reflection that I think is cringe, as my kid would say, tells me that they've missed something and then I can try to address it. If it's just one person, then I'm like, okay, well, they didn't try very hard for today, so they get a low score and move on. But if I see it across multiple reflections, then I'll bring it up in class. Um, so that gets to the question two of grading, like how do you handle 70 reading reflections? Um, so in my large classes, the GSI is graded and the default is full credit, unless it was something where like, Clearly, you just didn't pay attention to the readings and you're giving me something at token. Um, so it's not worth all that much in the grade. And the default is that everybody gets full credit. Um, but uh, so the GSI is graded in the large class, um, but I read a randomized subset each class, both to comment back to those students and to know what to bring into my lecture. Um, so if they submit it on Canvas, I might read 10 and then give them a sentence of feedback. Um, yeah. And in my, in my smaller elective classes where I don't have GSIs, it's the same except it's all me. The other thing that I do with reflections on smaller classes is I leave time for discussion when we're not behind. We're always behind, so it ends up not being all that often, but I might leave 10 or 15 minutes in class for students to share the reflection with their neighbor and then report back to me. It's a low cost way to get a group discussion going if you have extra time. Um, okay, the third thing I said that I did was make some content changes. So up till now, we've been talking mostly about like how I teach, right? Um, now let's look a little bit at some of the things that might come up specifically in a stats class. Okay, let's just let's just go all in. Uh, you all are not on camera. I'm the only one on camera. So let's do a show of hands. Do you teach methods named after eugenicists in any of your classes? Or developed by? Yeah, named after and or developed yeah, by. Sure. sure. So we basically all do. Right? 
Your students probably know this. If you do, and I think everybody who teaches a quant methods class does, some of your students probably know it. I was not taught this in grad school. And so like first semester, I'm putting together my slides and I wanna give some like cute little old tiny pictures of people whose, you know, whose names are attached to the test that we're using. So I go to Wikipedia to like, you know, find some cute old tiny pictures. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I can't use this to talk about these people um, because they are basically all eugenicists. So Fisher and Pearson, if you teach a first semester class, you probably teach Fisher's exact test. You probably teach Pearson's R. Um, you might, yeah, those are the two most basic ones, um, but there would be other things as well. So I realized that 100% of the named tests in my first semester class were named after eugenicists. So if I'm a student showing up and I know this and it's not addressed, you can see why I might start to think that quant methods are exclusionary because that's the intellectual history of them. <coughs> uh, here are some quotes from Fisher and Pearson, which I won't read out loud, but uh, you are welcome to read. You can find this in a very quick Google search. So as I say, many of your students might already know this. Um, so where does that leave us? You might decide not to talk about this at all. Uh, you might decide not to talk about it either because it's like contentious and you don't want to alienate people, or you might decide not to talk about it because you feel like what matters is how we use the test today, not how they were developed. So you might just not address this fact. But I think it gives us a really useful leverage point for thinking about how do you ethically use statistical methods. But the point is not that the methods themselves are necessarily inherently flawed, but the point is that these are really powerful methods that you can use to achieve many different social aims. And it's up to you as the researcher to think about the assumptions you're putting into your tests, the data you are or are not collecting, um, the way that you're writing up and communicating your tests. And so this is actually, I think, a really powerful teaching moment to say that you, the researcher, you know, my MPP student, you're going to have a lot of control when you get out into the world over how you use research methods. And so you should be aware of the pitfalls and also you should think about how to ethically use the methods. Um, so that's usually what I do. I, I give that sort of spiel at some point in the semester and I also post some readings about these people on Canvas and say, if you want to follow up more do and come to office hours. Um, usually a handful of students are like, yeah, I know. And then a number of students are like, whoa, there's always an audible gasp in the room when you first say it. I will say it's never derailed the past. It's just always led to the chance to talk about ethics in methods, which I think is always a good thing. Okay, so that was the, that was the hardest one. Let's do some easier examples. Um, early on in the semester, I teach uh, measurement, as I would assume many of you do, if it's a first semester class, we talk, talk about interval level variables, we talk about binary variables, um, and you know, lots of different ways of measuring and categorizing things. Um, and so I now point out what is obvious, but not always said, that gender is not actually binary, but that most textbooks and most sample data will treat it as such. And uh, if you have a class of, let's say that your cohort is 100 students, even if you only have half of them in your section, there's a good chance out of 100 that one of those students is non-binary. So if you stand up and say a binary variable is one with a yes, no, zero, one outcome, and gender is the best example, which many textbooks do, you've just alienated at least one person and everybody in the class that's friends with them. They're like, wait, it's not binary. <laughs> My friend <laughs> does not think of it as binary. You're telling me it is. Um, it's just an obvious point of conflict if you just treat it sort of naively as such. That doesn't mean that in most statistical methods we can encompass the broad diversity of human experience of sex or gender or sexuality. Um, 
But it does mean that we should acknowledge that when we make a variable and measure it in a binary way, that's restricting our analysis in some way. And maybe for the policy outcome you care about, it is irrelevant. That you know is frequently true. But you should always, when you're doing measurement, think about the assumptions that are going into your variable creation and the way that you're measuring your variable. So again, this is not to throw out the baby with the bathwater, but to use it as a teaching moment to remind ourselves of what assumptions we make when we're measuring variables. And then I usually say, okay, now that we've talked about this, I will note every survey we're gonna to use for the rest of the semester treats gender as a binary variable and we will be stuck with this. But when you go out in the world and you create data sets, you can think about the best ways to measure and whether data sets can be improved. We have the same discussion around race and ethnicity, and we look at a picture. Um, Pew has put out a nice infographic, email me if you want a copy of it, that looks at how the census treats race and ethnicity over time in the US across you know, more than 100 years. And you can just see how the ways that we measure race and ethnicity have evolved which shows there isn't like one universal truth that show up in survey data, but it's a question of the assumptions that we make. So again, I try to bring that back to a core teaching concept and say that everything we do this semester um, uses judgment calls and relies on assumptions. We're always trying to come up with uh, statistical methods that work with uncertainty where we don't know everything. If that's why we're here. If we knew everything, we wouldn't be in a stats class. So when we make simplifying assumptions to be able to implement our quant methods, what decisions do we make? Make sure you document them for yourself and for the reader. Don't choose an oper operationalization of a concept just because it supports the findings you want, obviously. None of us want our students to do that. Um, and evaluate the robustness of your final results to alternative definitions. Caveat is needed. Um, I want to make sure that this is one of the things that people will remember in five years if I call them up. Okay, I think this is the last, yeah, this is the last example, uh, and then we'll be right on time for Q&A and discussion. The last example I use uh, for today, limitations of averages. So in a first semester stats class, pretty much everything is based around averages, right? We'll teach the median and the mode, and we'll teach different percentiles, but it's not like we're teaching non-parametric methods based on quantiles, right? We then go on to teach a bunch of difference in means tests. Um, and then we get into regression analysis. And for most students, that's gonna be, again, questions about average treatment effects. So that's really useful. Those have nicely defined statistical properties, uh, and they frequently map into policy parameters we care about. Cost-benefit analysis relies on average costs and average benefits across the population. So, you know, an average treatment effect is great, but it's useful to remind students that that's a limitation in the sense that that is generally, in most policy analysis, the only thing that's being addressed. And that helps with a couple of things. Um, one criticism I've heard um, from quant students in various uh, universities is they'll be sitting in a stats class and the professor will say poverty program X was not found to have any effect. And then the student is like, wait, I'm in poverty program X. And that was really important for my family. Like that kept my family out of poverty. Um, so there's this disconnect, like they know that from their own experience, and there's a real disconnect if you stand up and say, this was found to have no statistically significant effect or only a very small effect. But if you remind them that the program is about averages, it's a reminder about what you're measuring in policy evaluation and what you're not measuring and why that is still a useful parameter. This helps some families, but not on average. So maybe we need to do heterogeneity analysis for instance. It also ties back to the sort of anecdotes versus quantitative analysis point that you might want to be making across the semester as a whole. Other things I have been trying, minor points, um, I'll throw up tables or figures and then say, what do you notice about this table? Talk with your neighbor. 
Um, sometimes I'll have people write it down and pass it in and I'll use that for participation points. It's really fun to look out on a class of 70 students and see them like talking to their neighbor and like pointing and it just, <laughs> um, you can tell that they're engaged because their body language tells you they're like trying to figure out that line versus that line. Um, and it breaks up the monotony of lecture, of course. Another thing I did this year was a whole day on interpretation wrap up to try to connect all the dots. Okay, now we've done differences in means and maybe we've done differences in proportions and chi square tests. We've done lots of different things. What does that look like in the wild when I graduate? And so I assigned um, two articles on data analysis in practice. Bradley and Kessler, uh, those two, it's not particularly important that I did those two, um, but both articles do a nice job of really laying out conceptually what methods they're using and what limitations and caveats there are. So it gave us a chance to step back and think about interpretation and application of the methods we've been seeing all semester. So we spent a whole day just on discussion of those two articles, and that's what their reading reflections were on. And then, darn it, the last thing I was going to show you was my Galton board, and I forgot to bring it in. Have you seen a Galton board? Okay, do you know the Plinko board in Price is Right? Okay, so the Plinko board, uh, you were not homesick in the 80s and 90s drinking beer and watching Price is Right as I was. Um, so it's this gigantic, like, life-size board, and it's got pegs in it, and they're laid out in an array. You drop a like hockey puck sized thing in and it randomly hits the pegs and bounces left or right. And then where it ends on the bottom after it's gone through eight rows of pegs tells you whether you won a thousand dollars or a new car. Um, so the Galton board, I wanted somebody to build me one of those for my classroom and I haven't found anybody yet who would do that. Um, so I bought Galton, Galton boards off of Amazon instead. That same idea, but in miniature. So there's all these little beads. You drop it, they start at one starting point, that black arrow on the top. They hit a bunch of pegs and then settle out into what starts to look like the normal distribution. Um, so it's a really beautiful way to introduce the normal and connect it back to randomization in nature and like why the normal distribution shows up so often in statistics. Um, otherwise, if you have sort of math averse crowd, the idea of the normal distribution just looks like an equation with some mu's and some sigmas and it doesn't connect. Um, so the Felton boards I think are really helpful. But if anybody watching wants to build me a life-size Plinko board, uh, send me an email. So I think the main takeaway is that what it took me many years to figure out is that there isn't like a quick fix we can all implement. So we have students coming from really different backgrounds, really different levels of math skill, different prioritizations of equity issues. I can't tell you to like go do this one trick uh, and then you'll be set. But I think what we can all do is understand what our students bring to the table and where their strengths are, try to learn from them as much as we teach them and try to connect with them on their terms at the same time that we keep the rigor of what we're doing and why we're doing. Um, and keeping that rigor means both making sure they learn the core concepts that we want them to remember in 20 years, but also that we recognize the limitations of our work, whether it means that it has a horribly ugly intellectual history, or whether that it can only tell you about the mean value and not about the distribution of values, um, or whether it means that it's relying on assumptions about how you categorize gender. That helps them understand more deeply what the underlying methods are. So I think that what I've taken away is that when I meet them on their terms and I am honest about the limitations, it can be inclusive and rigorous at the same time. Uh, last, this slide is not causal <laughs> for a number of reasons. Here's a pre post study on student performance and teaching evaluations uh, before and after my most recent revamp. Um, course grades went up seven percentage points. The final exam grade went up nine percentage points, not because I made it easier. In fact, I made the exam harder for different reasons. Um, and the evals went up. What I was most excited about was that on evaluations, there's that question, my interest in this subject matter has increased as a result of taking this class. 
And so in 2021, I had a 3.6 out of five, which is kind of depressing. Like we just spent three months talking about stuff and the median student, like math doesn't really care more than they did at the beginning of the semester. Um, but in the most recent year, it was a 4.2 out of five, um, which suggests to me that when they say in their evaluations that they're curious and they want to know more, that they would have done that. And there for questions. If the table is not causal, how would you explain the change? <laughs> Um, well, there were a number of other things that so for Zoomers, well, how do I'm I explain this kidding. change? I'm just kidding. There were a number of confounders. Ah, I see. Okay. So it, it has actually nothing to do with your talk. It has nothing okay. to right. do with my talk. All right. All right. All right. We did come out of COVID. What's that? Half your face. Fall 2021, we were in person, although that was a pretty ugly semester for many of us around campus. I see many nods, so you feel the same way. Yeah. I tried to use your methods on uh, uh, your method of, I, on the one hand, consulting with students and on the other hand, thinking about what do I want my students to know in five years. And I have to say, this is very frightening to me. If I think 30 years back, and if I think that one of my crazy maths teachers would have decided what he, usually it's a he, thought that I needed, I'm um, I would have preferred to pick which one mm -hmm. should actually determine. And and the same thing maybe with whether, whether it's three students or so, because I mean, of course, we're now living in a very, very particular time uh, that is quite radically different from five years ago and will be quite radically different, I'm absolutely sure, in five years. So so where do where so while I completely empathize and I think constantly about, and I experiment also in teaching, where, where do we get the strength to say that whatever our students say they want or whatever I think they should know is actually the correct way? That is like the meta question of how do we know what they should take away and is it what they want or is it what I want? So my end goals are not determined by me alone. They're determined in consultation with the other quant instructors at Ford. Um, so figuring out what I want them to remember at the end of the semester, I thought, first of all, I didn't do it the first year that I taught because I probably would have gotten it wrong. Um, but second of all, I didn't do it alone. So I talked to the person who teaches augmented. I talked to the people who teach the second semester regression analysis, and I talked to somebody who was at the time one of the administrators of the Ford School and came from a different social science background than I did. So had a different sense of what was useful. Because if I decide by myself, I'm gonna choose all the things economists do and I'm not gonna do the things that like public health people do and that would be really bad for a public policy school. Um, so the end goals are decided by not just me, but then I can figure out the best way to get to them. But this is still very skills oriented. I mean, this is still, Technology. Yes. I mean, do, do I want, you know, I would, I would find it actually really sad if one of my former students five years down the line could still tell me the difference between Fishers and Yates without having applied that. Then I think, well, good for you that you memorized that part of the lecture, but I really hope that I've actually done something more than that. Yeah, so we're trying to do, we're not, I mean, we're not just teaching skills. We're, we're like, this is the intellectual pursuit, right? I mean, I'm here on campus because I care about the intellectual pursuit and I care about learning, not just skills that you will apply on the job later. So for me, this is two things. One, recognizing that some students, you teach in a professional program as opposed to teaching in like LSNA, you will have a chunk of students who just think about what is intellectual curiosity different from you do. I just want to sit down in a room and nerd out. That is not what some of my students want. And if I target it at like nerdy me, um, then I have a bunch of students who are going to learn nothing. So I had some of these doubts at the beginning. And I was like, am I cheating them out of like the intellectual pursuit writ large? And then I was like, wait, they're not learning it. <laughs> so I can't do worse than what I'm currently doing. So what I'm trying to do is engage them with what they are curious about, which says they're not not curious, they're just curious about different things than I am curious about. So some of them care about making the world a better place. And I wanna give them ideas about how to critically engage with that goal. 
so that they don't fall into advocacy traps, but they like critically engage with difficult questions about what you do to make the world a better place. Um, but it's recognizing that their curiosity comes from that as opposed to like wanting to understand how an equation, where an equation comes from. So I think all of my students are curious. I think they're curious about different things than I am. Um, thanks, Katie. I was wondering if in the like revamps of this course, whether you rethought assessments broadly to make them more equitable and what you landed on? I did not for the most part, in part because they really <laughs> they need to learn certain things at the end of the semester. Uh, and if they don't know those things, they're in trouble down the line. So like my final exam is very similar. Um, and as I said, I, I think I tried to make it harder and they still did better on it. So where the assessment has changed a little bit is now they have these reading reflection scores that go into the final grade, but it's something like 10% of the final grade. So if you do all the reading reflections and then bomb the exam, you're not going to pass the class. And there's a little bit of participation scores for, as I said, this like talk with your neighbor and pass in a half sheet about what you learned from this table. Um, so yeah, so assessment didn't change all that much because they need to learn how to implement stuff at the end of the semester. I guess related to that question about assessments, I mean, uh, how, what was the student response in terms of the total amount of assessment that you're doing? Because daily assignments, so yeah, it's probably a lot of work. And then you have questions about, oh, is this you know fair to students who might have different constraints and might not get returned? I dropped the lowest two reading reflections so you can have two free passes if I was sick or I was busy preparing for something else and so I didn't do it um, and they also know that because they're getting full credit for most of them that if they flub some and hand in a terrible one and I give them two points out of ten that it's not going to matter um, so I've almost never gotten complaints about work level associated with reading reflections most people, if they're talking about them in evaluations at the end of the semester, said, thank you for keeping me honest. I wouldn't have read the textbook, yeah. <laughs> which is kind of amazing. Um, so they, most of them appreciate that. A small number of them say, I'm a grown up. Why are you making me prove that I read the textbook? But there are fewer of them that say that. Uh, we have Zoom a question questions. on the Zoom. I wonder if you have advice about creating exams and especially about incorporating code into stats exams. I've seen take home exams that require coding in class exams that may or may not require writing code, uh, pseudo code out by hand, or just uh, foregoing exams entirely in favor of other forms of assessment. Any thoughts? So, Bradley, how to incorporate uh, coding into assessments and particularly exams? I have no good solution for this. Um, the, the thing I'm still playing with is how I teach data to people who might not have ever coded before at the same time that they're trying to learn math and interpretation. Um, and I don't have good solutions yet. So, I would welcome follow up discussion with people later. I've been trying a lot of different things. I think there are ways to teach coding really well and then evaluate based on it. It just takes time away from the math and I really need them to learn the math too. So I don't, the time constraints keep getting me on coding. Um, but what I do is they have take home coding assignments and it's not on exams at all in terms of writing out code, but they do have to interpret stated results in exams, which is not a good solution. Another question. Is the right on the word about what you read Exercise actually sufficient to get them to read and meaningfully engage with their readings. You, know, you might think that since it's a hundred words, they wouldn't bother because you can like fake a hundred words pretty easily. I don't have the sense that they're doing that because they're like saying, you know, this is how this connects to what I do at my job. So they didn't, this person did not use chat GPT to write this reading reflection. <laughs> um, so I don't have the sense people are sort of skimping out. I think once you, if you assign good readings, once they start, once they start doing them, they will get drawn in and then they'll want to, and especially if you're giving feedback on the reflections, they want to give you a, not, a good reading reflection because they are interested in your feedback. So I sort of worried about people not actually trying to do the reading very well and I haven't had that experience, but it may depend on your students. Yeah, in your selection of reading materials, um, do you normally stay away from very highly controversial topic that can derail the whole thing and uh, 
in completely different directions? Yeah, what do you do with highly controversial topics? I asked both, both times that I hired students, I asked about this. What do you do with like abortion rights? What do you do with suicide? There are a lot of topics we could cover or not cover. I don't want my examples to be trivial, but I also get worried about derailing the math with the contextual stuff. So my students said, we don't care whether you do it or not, but if you use an example that's controversial, you better understand what you're talking about. So like for me, that means I might use controversial examples from climate change because I know it really well, but I might not use a controversial abortion example because I might not be able to answer their questions well. So you can use controversial things, but do it deliberately where you sort of, you know enough to be able to handle it respectfully in class without it derailing is what my students said. And I think they were smart about that. Maybe, yeah. I wonder, uh, so the, you've taught uh, master's students uh, primarily. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts about uh, how you would translate this for an undergraduate methods course. Um, where, uh, yeah, uh, for example, in LSA, where it would be both a shift from graduate student population to undergraduate, uh, but also uh, not a professional uh, right. uh, oriented audience. So I do teach undergrads and PhD students, but they're all policy students again. So they're not, you know, I think if I were teaching an e to econ students, it would be different because their aim is really different, right? The point of their degree is really different. Like a liberal arts degree is really different from an MPP. Um, I think the idea again of trying to engage with what they care about and leveraging that shows up no matter what level you're teaching, but the specific ways that you do that are gonna be really population specific. But I think you could do worse than just every couple of years hiring three students who took the class and giving them the space to be really honest with you about what they didn't like, not to like make it easier or dumb down, but to say, my generation does not connect with this because you were speaking past us. Um, Hiring students to help you understand it, you learn a lot and you figure out what's unique to your course. I think we're out of time, right? Yeah. I can stay. I'm happy to stay and chat, um, but I want people who need to go to, to head out. Right. Thanks, everybody.